Paul's letter to the Galatians deals with that matter of circumcision. Um, Gentile Christians of these Galatian churches came to believe what others were teaching them, namely that in order to become full-fledged members of the church of Jesus Christ, they also needed to submit to circumcision. And in the first century, that was another way of saying they needed to become Israel as far as um, um, national belonging concerns. They needed to be circumcised. So in his polemical letter, Paul argues that a return to circumcision is a return to the Old Covenant because circumcision happened to be the sign of the Old Covenant and that a return to the Old Covenant also entailed having to keep everything else that concerned the Old Covenant, keeping the whole law, as it were. And because of this polemical letter, and the last thing I want is to be, be, be critical of Galatians, but because of this polemical letter, Galatians and uh, circumcision, and circumcision in particular, has received its fair share of bad press. And many Christians, I believe, I've seen it, I've heard it, more or less unconsciously draw a straight line from circumcision to the law or to the ritual law. And they are mistaken. Circumcision does not belong to the law. Circumcision was given long before the ritual law came at Mount Sinai. Circumcision belongs to the time of promise. It belongs to the time of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. And God commanded all male members of Abraham's family to be circumcised, to receive the sign of the covenant as an identification with the gospel promise of a son who was to take away our sins by being cut off himself. That's what the sign of circumcision anticipated. Well, the son has come and the blood of the new covenant has been shed And the sign of the covenant has been changed. We no longer receive circumcision as the sign of the covenant of grace, but we now receive baptism as the sign of the covenant. Baptism is the covenant sign signifying the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, as Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says. John, John the Baptist, testified that while he was baptizing at the River Jordan, God spoke to him. He said, this is John 133, He who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the sign of the Holy Spirit applying all the benefits of Christ's finished work to his people, that is, his atonement for our sins and our being raised to new life by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Of course, now, you can ask the question, why in the world are we putting that sign on our tiny children like you will now witness tiny little Elijah who has no clue as to what is happening to him other than that he feels the water on his head. Why do we do this? Put the sign on little children? And we don't even know whether they are saved. Well, if God wanted to have the sign of baptism applied only to people who are truly saved, beyond the shadow of a doubt, then God would have to do the baptizing himself, wouldn't he? And not only that, but Jesus commanded his apostles and us also to do the baptizing. More so, that argument would then have to be applied to circumcision as a sign of the old covenant 
in just the same way. And yet God says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And the sign of the covenant of grace under the old covenant was put on both. Both of them received the sign. And the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, they did do just that. They baptized, they put the sign of the new covenant, baptism on entire households, including children. They were Jews. And they, they were steeped in the teachings of the Old Testament. And they practiced what had come down to them, as they knew, from the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers who had received the promise of God, the promise of the covenant of grace. And God never revoked this practice. God never said, stop doing this, and now only baptize those who make a profession of faith. But for this change to occur, God would have to make such an announcement because it is important, don't you think? God never rescinded the practice of including the children and giving them the sign of the covenant. The New Testament does document a shift from the seventh day to the first day of worship, but it never sanctions a change in the matter of the covenant sign also applied to the children of the covenant. As a matter of fact, the only change that the New Testament does sanction is that the apostles not only baptized male members of the family, but they also baptized females now, which was a novelty, as you see in the case of Lydia in Acts chapter 16. And because the circumcision of males only under the old covenant pointed to the exclusive nature of God's salvation. The salvation being located in one son, in the person of his only son. But now that he has come, the spirit, as Joel 2.28 foresaw, is poured out on all flesh even on the male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And so the sign of baptism points to the spirit who washes us clean like the sprinkling of water, as Ezekiel 36, 25 put it. And this sprinkling is so that we may be clean from all our uncleannesses. And when we make our children, or when we include our children, when our children receive the sign of baptism, we do not assume and we do not say that they are saved. No more than Old Testament believers did in, un, in circumcision, but we place God's name on them. We place God's name on them and... With the name, we place the promise of God on our children. The promise that he declares to all people. The promise is to you, this is Acts 2.17, and to your children, and to all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself.